Somewhere beneath the unpredictable waters of Lake Erie lies a mysterious shipwreck sunk by a storm almost 200 years ago. Since 1818, she has lain silent, guarding a trove of archaeological treasures. Armed with detailed research and sophisticated technology, the sea hunters attempt to uncover this historic prize, the last remains of the tall ship Young Phoenix. With over 100 million books in print, Clive Custler is the grand master of shipwreck tales and adventure. Director of the Vancouver Maritime Museum, James Delgado is one of the world's foremost marine archaeologists. With over 20 years diving experience, Mike Fletcher is an internationally renowned dive master. Leading the Econova dive team, John Davis has coordinated shipwreck searches around the globe. Together, they explore the planet's last frontier in search of true adventures with famous shipwrecks. They are the Sea Hunters. A wise man once wrote, an object lost and hidden waits and whispers. In shipwreck hunting, some wrecks whisper louder than others. Embarking on a search for a lost shipwreck takes dedication, perseverance, and a grip on your imagination so you don't get carried away on a wild goose chase. The search can be long and tedious, the raveling together of bits of lore and legend with research and modern technology. And even after your best efforts, the wreck may simply refuse to be found. Now join us as we search for a sailing ship which sank nearly 200 years ago. She was called Young Phoenix. When Lake Erie throws a tantrum, all hell breaks loose. In minutes, tranquility turns into mad fury. High wind and crashing waves take their toll. Wooden ships groan under the beating. Their masts bend and snap with the weight of the rigging. Their hulls gape open. Over the years, Lake Erie has claimed hundreds of shipwrecks and thousands of lives. Many of those ships set sail from port in sunshine and ran smack into one of Lake Erie's bad moods. Many sank with no survivors. And for many of these ships, no one knows where they went down. They simply disappeared. Young Phoenix had 160 Irish immigrants on board when she went down. Most everything these men and women had owned went down with the ship. Clothing, books, farm tools, household goods, family heirlooms. These immigrants lost the irreplaceable treasures of their Irish lives. Well, John, if our mission is to go look... Sea Hunters John Davis, Mike Fletcher, and James Delgado meet to select the target sites for an expedition to find young Phoenix. To help with the search, they have obtained side-scan images of various wrecks in the area, provided by local shipwreck hunter Gary Kozak. I've taken a good hard look at the side scan records and they're crisp, they're clean, and they show three ships that look to be early sailing ships, which is ideal for young Phoenix. From the side scan images, the team has chosen three wrecks that will provide dive sites for the search. With any luck, one of these locations will be the last resting place of the young Phoenix. Use, using that as our base, get out and take a look at these sites. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Great Lakes are like five sisters, each with its own size, shape, mood, and temperament. Lake Erie is the second smallest, the most shallow, and the most bad-tempered. According to Gary Kozak's sonar sweeps, the best bet is a stretch of water located near Long Point Cut, which is about 13 nautical miles, or 24 kilometers, from the fishing village of Port Dover. Mike enlists an old friend, Captain Jack Collins, and the Nadro Clipper to take the team hunting. Captain Jack has been sailing and fishing Lake Erie for more than 40 years. 
He pretty much knows every square meter of the eastern end of this great lake. For Mike Fletcher, this is a homecoming. He is from this small community and has been hunting the wrecks of Lake Erie for most of his career. Gary Kozak isolated several locations where fishermen reported they had been snagging nets. The team has swept those locations with side-scan sonar and identified three objects on the bottom that have the shape and appearance of shipwrecks. Now they are going to dive each one of them. With any luck, one will be the immigrant ship, Young Phoenix. By the look of the sky and the action of the water, Captain Jack feels bad weather closing in. Topography has a lot to do with Lake Erie's bad moods. The gently rising land on either side of the lake channels winds along an east-northeast to west-southwest axis. These prevailing southwesterlies blow steady at 10 to 15 knots, often exceeding 20 knots in the summer and winter months. Wind shifts, however, are common and sudden. Combined with prevailing southwesterlies, they stir up steep waves and cross seas. Wind speeds often hit 40 knots or more, and the lake can experience surges of over one and a half meters or five feet. Add to this a funneling effect at the east end of Lake Erie, and the result is such unpredictability that sailors hardly sleep when crossing the lake. And when they do, it's usually one eye at a time. Then there are the thunderstorms and the water spouts. Water spouts are tornadoes on the lake. They're brought on by cold air pushing over the warm, shallow water. The funnel is composed of water vapor in a low pressure vortex. Water spouts occur between late July and October. They occur for only half a dozen days each year, but when they do, they can pose a serious threat. Which way the angle goes to the bow? As the team prepares to dive the first of the targets, expectations run high. Mike will be supported by a dive team led by veteran wreck hunter Rick Haupt. If you're going to hunt for shipwrecks with someone else, you want to make sure, first of all, that it's someone that you, first of all, trust, and someone that's uh, honest with you, and that you have a clear set of rules before you start. What can you expect and what's realistic about uh, this wreck we might find, if we're lucky enough to find it? Uh, aside from that, you better pick partners who are hardworking, don't mind putting up with a lot of aggravation, and most of all, that they do it because they enjoy doing it. The fun must be tempered with skill, experience, and carefully maintained equipment. What they hope to find is a wreck from the early 1800s, a museum piece loaded with all the earthly possessions of 160 Irish immigrants, their farm tools, personal and household goods, and a treasure trove of memories in the form of heirlooms from their Irish homes. They left everything on board when they escaped the sinking ship. They made it to shore and were housed by local farmers who had helped rescue them. These immigrants had just experienced the ever-changing Lake Erie weather, sunshine and storm changing back and forth by the day and by the hour. They lived on hope alone, hope that they would be rescued. Hope is the mainstay of the wreck diver, too. Faith and hope. Each time they get in the water, they believe this is the one. This is the dive to the wreck they've always been looking for. Not long ago, diving Lake Erie was like diving through a lake of gloom. It was once one of the most polluted of the Great Lakes. By the early 1990s, zebra and quagga mussels likely from the Caspian and Black Sea regions, had invaded the lake. Because the mussels filter algae from the water, clarity has improved significantly, as much as 60% in some areas. A diver now has no difficulty in distinguishing the details of a shipwreck on the bottom. At 28 meters, 
were 92 feet deep. The camera lights cut through the dimness, and the wreck appears as though from a dream. Once again, a shipwreck works its magic on the imagination. It is so well intact, so well preserved in the cold, fresh water. Except for the muscle and crustacean, this ship looks as though it could set sail tomorrow. It's a big ship, perhaps too big. This is the main step, which once held the ship's main mast. It's possible the mast had snapped when the ship hit the rocks, or perhaps the crew chopped it off to keep the ship from capsizing. A snagged fisherman's net hangs over the hole. Is it possible the artifacts and heirlooms of the Irish immigrants are down below, buried under nearly 200 years of sediment? Before the team risks going down below and stirring the sediment, they must be certain this wreck is young Phoenix. A shipwreck gives the past a physical shape, something to touch. This ship once sailed, running free or bearing down to the wind. It carried cargo back and forth across the Great Lakes. Those who sailed her were hard, competent men. Their average age was 17. They knew the glory and spirit of sail. And they knew the risk. In the 1800s, shipping traffic was high on the Great Lakes because the lakes were a highway into the heartland of North America. And on that highway, the ships were the freight trucks of the day. There are hundreds of shipwrecks on the bottom of the Great Lakes because you could have a catastrophic event. A storm would come up and catch hundreds of ships out in the open. And in a single night, dozens of ships would go to the bottom. There are some areas on the lakes that have more wrecks than others, and one of those is the Long Point Peninsula. Running between Buffalo and Detroit, ships hugging the coast would have to cross each other in that high traffic area. Fog would come in, a storm would spring up, or a snow squall, visibility would be cut to zero, and ships could collide or run aground and sink. As a result, the area off Long Point is littered with shipwrecks. The team discovers an important clue, a capstan. Its design and manufacture is from an era much later than young Phoenix. Size is probably the most obvious indication that this is not young Phoenix. This wreck is roughly 50 meters or 164 feet stem to stern. Young Phoenix would have measured much less than that, perhaps 27 to 35 meters or 114.8 feet long. This wreck has all the appearance of a Great Lake schooner from the late 1800s. Its two masts were probably wire rigged and it probably carried a cargo not of Irish immigrants, but of Western grain or iron ore. There's a sad joy in seeing a shipwreck, a tragic beauty in the sagged beams and broken deck planks, something bittersweet. A shipwreck is a tangible link to the past, a touchstone about how life on the Great Lakes once was. This wreck is a magnificent artifact, an enormous museum piece that is well worth preserving as it is and where it is. Fishing nets hang from the port side. It's as though the ship had been caught in a web of time and dragged to the bottom for eternity.
The divers make their way to the bridge. There in the chart table is the ship's brass compass. Who was the last to use it to chart a course? It points west, a direction most immigrants believed was the promised land. To see this wreck in such a state of preservation, with its wheel fixed on the course it was running, it's hard not to imagine it under full sail. It may not be young Phoenix, but it's a remarkable discovery, a wreck well worth the effort to find, well worth remembering. It was uh, really nice to be able to go down and see all of the items that were part of the ship's navigation or its workaday items. All of those things are still there. I'd like to think they'll stay there forever. I know certainly uh, when we left, they were left exactly as we found it. And we, we'd all like to believe that that's the way it will, will go on forever. It is not long before the team is en route to the next dive site. Without warning, they're experiencing a drastic change in weather. Storm clouds have blown in, and lightning flashes not very far away. So strong is the wind that Captain Jack decides to end the search and head for shore. Large highs and lows like to center around the Great Lakes, and those extreme high and lows come up very quickly and uh, cause the weather patterns to change very quickly. Incredible winds that will be uh, born in a matter of a couple of hours. Young Phoenix ran just such a storm in September 1818. On board were 160 Irish emigrants bound for land grants on the northwest shore of Lake Erie. Young Phoenix ran a headwind shortly after leaving port. By the time they neared Long Point, the wind was blowing a heavy gale. The captain ordered the ship rigged for sitting out the storm and waiting for a favorable wind. But the good weather was slow in coming. One story says young Phoenix was drifting two miles off Long Point when it took on water and started to sink. The Irish immigrants and crew made for the lifeboats. They pulled for an isolated stretch of shoreline. From the beach, they peered through sheets of rain to watch all of their past and much of their future sink beneath the driven waves. The next day, with the storm subsided, the hunt for the young phoenix continues. The first of Gary Kozak's map coordinates has been eliminated. The team must now prepare to dive site number two. Mike has decided to helmet dive the next wreck site, a skill he's honed through 20 years of experience. The crew will operate the dive stage, which will assist Mike in making his descent. Gary Kozak's next set of coordinates will take the team about 20 kilometers or 12 miles from Port Dover to out past Long Point Cut. If the coordinates are as exact as everything else Gary Kozak does, Mike expects to drop anchor, if not on the wreck site, then to within 30 feet or 10 meters of it. Dave Chacha, the ROV specialist, runs through a checklist on the ROV systems before testing its operation underwater. The ROV has four torque balance thrusters that are counter-rotating. Camera lights are 250-watt tungsten halogen underwater lamps. 
The video camera has autofocus, auto iris, and a wide angle lens. The camera mount can rotate 300 degrees. The ROV has been tested at depths of over 450 meters or 1,500 feet. The thrusters can propel the ROV to a speed of four knots. It's a great piece of search equipment for ground truthing a wreck when conditions prevent a diver from diving it. Ground truthing is the objective of this expedition. From Gary Kozak's sonar sweeps, the team knows they have a wreck on the bottom. What they don't know is what it looks like. Ground truthing is important in the process of identifying a shipwreck because a sonar image alone isn't good enough. What looks convincingly like a shipwreck might be a ship-shaped rock. But with good sonar, you can delineate a target. You can see if it's a steamer or a sailing ship because you can see the paddle wheel or you can see the masts with a good image. But to really see what it is, in particular if you want to identify the ship, you've got to go down there and eyeball it. One eyeball they often use is the video camera on the ROV. If this dive site proves not to be Young Phoenix, Dave Chacha will use the ROV at the next dive location. In preparation for that dive, he will test his controls. Once the ROV is safely in the water and the lift cable removed, Dave Chacha takes control. According to the sonar image, the wreck is about 60 meters or 197 feet deep. The plan is for Mike Fletcher to helmet dive to the wreck and attach a line for the scuba divers to follow. Warren Fletcher, Mike's son, is also a trained commercial diver. Warren will be the backup diver. We're diver one. Okay, Mike, we're recording. We're on mine. I'm sorry, say again, Jerry? Yeah, we're on mine here, Mike. We've got uh, recording action happening. Okay, uh, Jerry, if you turn down the volume to me, uh, we'll get a lot less uh, background noise. How's that, Mike? Yeah, how's that, Reed? How do you hear me there? I hear you good, Mike. Okay, I can hear the uh, gas is starting to come in now. Yeah, I hear your voice going. Okay. I'm going to vent now. I hear you, Mike. The helium in the gas mixture has Mike's voice sounding like a cartoon character. Let me know when you're leaving there. OK. We're all set to go here. In a deep dive, helium in the mixture helps prolong a diver's time on the bottom, and it shortens his decompression time. There we go. Okay, I'm all clear. <clears throat> the objective is to gather as much evidence as possible for identifying the wreck. Mike will document the wreck's general size and design. Right. The scuba divers will videotape the details of ship construction. The ROV will penetrate the lower deck and the cargo hold. The team believes the cargo will be what determines whether or not this wreck is the young phoenix. And the right to the corner, okay? Go get that. No, yeah, Mike, I'm having a real hard time making you up with your Donald Duck talk there, but uh, maybe just keep things simple. Roger. Can you turn the right to the corner on? Oh, stand by. The plan is for Mike to tie off the dive line on the wreck check the wreck's stability and determine if the wreck is a sailing ship and whether it has the size, shape, and mass configuration of a young Phoenix-era vessel. 
He'll use the dive stage almost like an elevator, so his descent and ascent can be slow and less tiring. The scuba divers will follow Mike, descending with the stage to a depth of about 20 meters or 66 feet. They'll hover at that depth to provide backup support should anything go wrong when Mike reaches the wreck. The ROV follows Mike down to 20 feet or six meters, so Mike can run through the checklist for the ROV's operation in the water. Dave runs a few maneuvers with the ROV to get the feel of the joystick and the ROV's response to his smallest movement. The two-way communication allows Mike and Dave Chacha to adjust buoyancy on the ROV and make sure the camera lights are working. Once the ROV checks out, Dave Chacha maneuvers it clear of Mike and the dive stage. Okay, go ahead with the boat, huh? Roger that, Mike. Go down. On the surface, the team monitors Mike's air supply and the video images from the helmet camera. They see what he sees. It's as close as they can get to sensing what he senses at 70 meters or 239 feet deep in water so dark he would see nothing without the light on his helmet. I'm on the wreck. Once on the wreck, the diver has the constant worry of snagging the hose and line and the pester of pulling them behind. Always careful not to damage the fragile sections of a hundred, sometimes 200-year-old wreck. That's good. Okay, slack a little bit. I'm gonna go around the capstan here, which is gonna be very, very stable. I'm gonna stir things up a little bit, but uh, it's going to be extremely safe place to snap in. Mike will use a capstan for tying a line on the wreck. Probably the single strongest structure on the entire ship. These vertical capstans were used to uh, raise the uh, square sails and the gaff rig sails. Okay, now, I don't know why, but uh, the diver's light's just gone down. Mike's light has dimmed. He keeps cool and waits. Negative, do you know what happened to my light? Awesome. Okay, I'm uh, working really hard not to stir things up. Is that any better? With the light back, Mike can go forward. That was just the kind of situation where Mike's experience kept him from getting into trouble. the main mast this way, then the stage, and then above the stage, the step of the top mast. See how you can see two masts there? Well, that's the step from the, from the first mast to the second mast, or the top mast. So we'll go back to the ship now. 
we try and make our way to the stern and the uh, steering wheel. Mike's description of the mast clearly indicates that this wreck is not the young Phoenix. This wreck was a sailing ship, a Great Lakes schooner, bow heavy in the muddy bottom. She was probably built sometime in the 1850s or 1860s. If not the young Phoenix, then what ship is it? Very good on my slack there. Now imagine you were a crew member working here on the deck and right here on the state on the back deck there was this raised area from the main deck you'd walk right through this companion way there'd be a sliding hatch that would move across the deck and you'd go right down inside the quarters of the ship and then there you'd be right inside the ship. And of course, down in here would be the, the quarters for cooking and, and living aboard the ship. The mid-1800s was the heyday for sailing ships on the Great Lakes. The days when newspapers reported commercial activity on Lake Erie as news, and when a ship foundering in a storm made banner headlines. In November 1869, newspapers reported the tragic results of a severe storm that blew across the Great Lakes. Nearly 100 ships were lost in that storm. More than 60 of them were sailing ships, schooners or barks. Perhaps this wreck was one of them. The steering mechanism on a sailing ship is one good clue for dating a wreck. Its construction is another. So is the kind of rigging it used. But Mike won't have the chance to investigate for these clues. Okay, the mud started to move in on me. He stirred up a storm of sediment. It will take all of his concentration to follow the umbilical cord to the dive stage and get himself out of the wreck. his way to the stern. See the base of uh, one of the masts that snapped off. And the diver's ready to leave bottom. Diver is ready to leave bottom. Diver's ready to leave bottom. Up on the down line. Up on the nylon line. Up on okay. The, up on the sunlight. The line is coming up. Swimming and walking in the commercial dive suit is draining. It would sap most of a diver's strength to hold himself suspended in order to decompress. The stage provides Mike with a stable platform for waiting out the decompression time and for raising him out of the water. Mike reports that the wreck is sitting below the line of thermocline and that the water surrounding the wreck is bitter cold. A thermocline is the dividing line between warm surface water and cold water on the bottom. Cold water on the bottom could cut in half the amount of time the scuba divers have on the wreck, and that could slow the process of gathering evidence. Mike secures himself in the diving cage. So far, 
The team knows the wreck on the bottom is again too recent to be young Phoenix. The final resting place of the young Phoenix continues to elude them. In wreck hunting, the path to your goal is rarely easy and direct. Shipwrecks are never found until they want to be found. So even though this dive did not turn up young Phoenix, we know we're in the right ballpark. Every wreck we explore and survey fills in another piece of history of this great waterway. We've eliminated this site as a candidate for young Phoenix, so now we'll move on to another likely target, the next ghostly image revealed by the side scan sonar. The team quickly repositions the clipper to the final set of Gary Kozak's coordinates. For surveying this site, the team will use the ROV, or remotely operated vehicle. Everyone hopes that this third location will be the final resting place of the young Phoenix. The best way to ground truth is with video, because with video, you have a permanent record, an image of what you've seen on the bottom. One of the best ways to get that video is to send down an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, because unlike a diver, the ROV never gets cold, it never gets tired, you never have to worry about decompression. One of the disadvantages of an ROV is that it can get tangled, and so you need a skilled operator to keep that from happening. But with that operator, an ROV capturing video is an ideal way to ground truth. It is now up to Dave Chacha and the ROV to gather the evidence needed to identify the wreck. Maneuvering the ROV, tracking it on the sonar scope and operating the camera all at the same time is difficult. It requires incredible concentration and an ability to imagine oneself actually in the ROV and traveling to the lake bottom. I'm not seeing the wreck yet, are you? No. And what are the increments? They're set for five meters right now. The sonar screen pinpoints the ROV's location in relation to the wreck. Dave stops seeing through his own eyes and concentrates on seeing only what the ROV sees. It's as though the ROV has become an extension of himself. You're good. Straight ahead, you're going to see it. Is it? And what we need now is the focus. Yeah. Do you want to move left or right? Okay. Yeah, we'll, uh, change that to 10 meters. Uh, yeah. Could you? Yeah. yeah. Let's let's okay, just let's just thing. Uh, play it up because we have to get it on the screen. We want to go to is. grid or. Yeah, we'll check it out. That's almost. So you're gonna you're gonna yeah. turn to starboard and head out that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, guys, we are on the wreck. Wonderful. Okay, that's it. The stepped rudder was common to 19th century Great Lake sailing ships. The stern is formed with a raking deep V transom. The rudder stock passed through it. The evidence is mounting. So where you want to start? Go up and over the up. side. Yeah. See you. There's there's the hull right there. You're right parallel with it. So go up the hull, and then we'll get out of the mud. Yeah. 
Dave maneuvers the ROV over the gunnel and onto the deck. Let's go over it, see if we can uh, reach mid-deck, and then let's just do a, a, a 180. Okay. This ship has a wheel set low in the stern for the helmsman to get out of bad weather. Dave positions the ROV to penetrate the hold to get a good look at the cargo. If you, if you turn it all to port, you'll line up on it. tight squeeze through the hatch and down into the hold. Clearly, the many years Dave spent in a video arcade have paid off. Now he must be careful not to stir the silt, or the team won't be seeing anything but a cloud. Snagging the cables is another concern. Okay, I'm going down all the way. Are you? Yeah. Double planks for sheathing. Ship knees support timber scantling. The detail of how this ship was built is incredible. Moving them, we have, uh, okay, I'm on something right now. So you're hung up? No, it's just I can't go down right now. So it's sitting right there. Yeah. Okay, it must be with the anchor chain or something. It's a rope. Yeah. Okay, let this uh, settle out a little bit. Okay, there it is. Okay. Right there, covered in silt, is a stove. And there are more of them. Oh, I lost it. This wreck was carrying a cargo of cast iron wood stoves. For the team, finding this cargo is disappointing, for they now know that this wreck cannot be the young Phoenix. While the team was in the field, we continued to do historical research. And so when the last target was found to be a wreck with a cargo of railroad iron and cast iron stoves, I knew right away that it was a wreck of a bark named Tradewind. It was an important discovery, and it added something to the archeological record but it wasn't young Phoenix. To find her, the new research indicated we'd have to look farther south, on the American side of Lake Erie, not on the Canadian shore. While they didn't find young Phoenix, the team's work was a success, though. By ground-truthing all those wrecks, we were able to bring a close to a 150-year-old story, an interesting story, of a ship named Tradewind. The Tradewind departed Buffalo, New York, in the last days of November, 1854 and was bound for Chicago, Illinois. She was carrying a cargo of 200 tons of railroad iron on its upper deck and a 1,000 cast iron wood stoves in the hold. On the same day, the schooner Sir Charles Napier had raised sail for Buffalo. By the time the Napier had reached the waters off Long Point Cut, a blinding snowstorm was blowing across Lake Erie. Napier's bowsprit stabbed into the hull of the other vessel. The bowsprit snapped, and the Napier pulled away. Her crew called out, but there was no reply. A few hours later, the snowstorm cleared. Napier was alone on the water.
Except for the Napier's snapped bowsprit, there was no sign another ship had even been there. The only other ship known to have been near Long Point was Tradewind. When Tradewind failed to arrive in Chicago a few days later, those in the shipping business were now certain that the ship Napier had struck in a blinding snowstorm, the one that went to the bottom within minutes, was Tradewind. But there's one important clue that could solve the mystery of this vessel's death, the murder weapon, so to speak. Dave takes the ROV out of the hold to explore the starboard side of the wreck. Okay, you've, you've got out of... I'm off of it? Yeah. Got okay. To, I think you've got to turn the port. There it is. The Napier's bowsprit stabbed into the starboard side. Without doubt, this wreck is the trade wind. And the team is the first to document it on videotape. Another of Lake Erie's mysteries solved. Another chapter of her story told. And yet there is a sense, not of defeat, but of stalemate. Despite their best efforts, the young phoenix remains undiscovered. Until next time. And now it's your turn to get up off that couch and go into the deserts, go into the mountains, go under the lakes, the rivers, and the seas, and search for history. You'll never find a more rewarding adventure. Join us again as we search the oceans of the world for lost and famous shipwrecks. Another true adventure with The Sea Hunters. <laughs> <laughs>